Good morning. Welcome to Come and Reason Bible Study here in, in Collegedale, Tennessee. We're glad that the folks here here in class, we're glad that the folks online are joining us from around the world. Um, let's begin our class with prayer today. Father in heaven, we uh, are so grateful that we have an opportunity to come to study, to have the, the facets of your character revealed to us, and you promise that your spirit would be with us and enlighten our minds. Father, we want to pray this morning for Zoe's uh, mother, Mary, who has fallen and broken her pelvis. Um, we know that she is, is in pain. We, we send healing thoughts and prayers and prayers for strength and comfort and traveling mercies for family members. Um, please bless our study today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I have the same recurring nightmares as Wendell has um, that, first of all, He's going to count down, and there's going to be no one standing up here. <laughs> and everybody's going to be looking for who's teaching when it occurs to me that it was my week. And then the second nightmare, of course, is that the lesson that I prepared is different from the week we're on. So <laughs> um, this week, uh, we are studying, whether that was the right lesson or not, we're studying lesson six. And it's entitled, What You See Is Not What You Get. So has anyone here ever heard of the acronym WYSIWYG? Of an acronym called WYSIWYG. That acronym stands for what you see is what you get. I first heard of that term um, in relation to my line of work, which is in technology and computers. So does anybody remember a word processing program called WordPerfect? <laughs> you might want to keep that to yourself. Um, so yeah, WordPerfect was kind of the, the father of word processing back before Microsoft and Windows. And it was a, a powerful program. It had a lot of capabilities, but it was, it was rather structured. It had a, a blue screen, a blue background screen, white text. And really, regardless of what you did to your document, how you formatted it, how you changed it, the screen pretty much stayed the same. Still blue screen, still white text. And the only way that you could even see kind of what sort of formatting had been applied was to reveal codes, which was the Alt F3 shortcut for the nerds in the room along with me. Um, so that kind of gave you a, a look under the covers and would show you the formatting codes and you could see what text had been bolded, underlined, italicized, and how it had been changed. Um, but other than that, the only way to see the way the document was going to turn out was to actually print it. So then along came Microsoft Word and Windows and WYSIWYG editing and programming so that everything looked on the screen exactly like it was going to look when the program was rendered or when the document was printed. So the premise of this week's lesson is that we very seldom have this level of insight into our environment, into our relationships, into our situations. And uh, what we see is often not what we get. The lesson says we see so little, and what we do see always comes filtered through our own minds including our own preconceived notions, our biases, our distortions, dysfunctions. Our eyes, our ears, even all of our senses together still only give us a very narrow view of the big picture. So think about the limited view of reality that we have right here in this room. There's things out there that we know are real, but we can't sense them in any way, we can't see them. So how many radio waves are in the air all around you? that are operating your cell phones. We have a wireless network running in here. Um, we have satellites, I'm guessing, across the hall on the police station, radars. Um, what about when it says, whenever two or three are gathered together in my name, God is there in the midst of them? Do we start to see how limited our vision and our senses really are? So, Saturday's lesson. Let's take a look at Saturday's lesson. The memory text is Proverbs 14, 12. And it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Any thoughts on what uh, Solomon's talking about here? 
I was raised on this text. Mm -hmm. My mother constantly would say this text to us. So <clears throat> even though you may think you're right, right, you're still going down the wrong road, so it's still wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think we tend to have fairly narrow myopic even perspectives. Everything tends to revolve around us. We're very focused on, we make judgments on external behaviors because we can't really see other people's heart motives. We tend to be kind of control freaks. Don't like to admit that we're really helpless in our situation, completely dependent on God for our existence, in desperate need of a savior. When I say we here, I mean me. <laughs> Um, so we careen blindly on with plans that seem so selfishly right and many times lead us straight into disaster. So can you think of any folks in the Bible who likely thought they were doing exactly the right thing but were actually without intervention on the path to death? Any examples from the Bible? Pharisees. 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 Yes. What about Adam and Eve? Pretty sure they thought eating the fruit was the right thing to do. What about Cain? Lucifer. Lucifer. Oh, exactly. I have down in here everyone on earth other than Noah's family. <laughs> no one thought it was going to rain. Lot's wife. Nahab and Abihu. I've got Saul and Paul prior to conversion. Um, yeah, and the, this text author, Solomon. I have a quote here from one of the founders of our church. Solomon's course brought its sure penalty. His separation from God through communication with idolaters was his ruin. As he cast off his allegiance to God, he lost the mastery of himself. His moral efficiency was gone which is an interesting term. Are we very morally efficient these days? His fine sensibilities became blurred. His conscience was seared. He who in his early reign had displayed so much wisdom and sympathy in restoring a helpless babe to its unfortunate mother fell so low as to consent to the erection of an idol to whom living children were offered as sacrifices. He who in his youth was endowed with discretion and understanding and who in his strong manhood had, seen inspired, had been inspired to write, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In later years departed so far from purity as to countenance licentiousness, revolting rites connected with the worship of Chemosh and Ashtoreth. He tried, but at what cost, to unite light with darkness, good with evil, purity with impurity. From being one of the greatest kings that ever wielded a scepter, Solomon became a profligate, the tool and slave of others. His character, once noble and manly, became enervated. I had to look up a bunch of these words in this quote because <laughs> that means weakened, debilitated, fatigued, and effeminate. His faith in the living God was supplanted by atheistic doubts. Unbelief marred his happiness weakness his principles and degraded his life. The justice and magnanimity of the early reign were changed to despotism and tyranny. Poor, frail human nature. That's from Prophets and Kings. So, I also have a text, the 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that I think is related to this, where it says, we don't yet see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. We'll see it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. In the interim, I think we have to walk by faith and not by sight. We can be so easily deceived about the external world. Sadly, we can also be just as deceived about ourselves. So how do we protect ourselves from these deceptions? Do you have any biblical counsel that comes to mind as to how to focus on reality and uh, not be deceived by thinking ourselves better than we are? I mean, we're studying Proverbs. 
Can y'all think of any any counsel? Yes, Russell. My first thought with the memory text was it tied into the Jeremiah text that says the human heart is evil above all things who can know it. Um, both of these are a commentary on our fallen nature. Right. You know, the, the the genetic change that occurred in Adam and Eve when they when they made their choice uh, that, that the rest of humanity is paid dearly for. <coughs> and I don't know, it just kind of break, it keeps, keeps in mind that um, we, we continue to need a Savior. Right. You know, no matter where we are along that path of salvation, whether we're mere infants or whether we've grown up into you know, an intellectual and spiritual maturity, we are still, we are still combating that, that, uh, that, that nature is still at war. Right. It's still at war with that nature. And it remains a terminal disease. Correct. Without intervention. So Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one that will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. There's another text in Proverbs that says, trust in God with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It's because our own understanding is often distorted and wrong, particularly when, when viewing ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. Or it's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. Psalm 37, 23, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Proverbs 16, 9, a man's, plan, a man, man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps and makes them sure. So I was also thinking... Uh, our unique perspective, I think, on the great controversy that's going on in the universe can give us some insight and can help us or keep us from being so small-minded and so self-focused to know that what's going on in the universe is not all about us. It's God who has been accused. It's his character that's been maligned. And there's a war being waged all around us for hearts, for minds, for souls. Um, so I think, I think we're blessed to have that insight and to have it something that helps us maintain uh, a viewpoint that there is something out there bigger than ourselves. I was also thinking, are there some concepts, are there some precepts that we've learned in this class that also protect, can help protect ourselves from being deceived or our self-perception being distorted. Yes, Wendy. We talked before about um, the threefold um, view of, of God, you know, science. Yes. Science, you know, and that, I mean, there are many individuals in this world who believe that they are correct, just like our text said, mm -hmm. who are following the Bible in a way that may not be a but completely person. sincere completely sincere yeah i have the the three-pronged uh integrative evidence-based approach down as as a as one of the the helpful tools because our feelings can be wrong our self-perception can be wrong but when you when you allow yourself to test theories situations concepts against all three principles your experience scripture science it helps to filter out some of those more subjective points of view and lets you test it against all three and come up with a, a hopefully a more accurate conclusion. Um, I've also got down just applying natural law principles can help immediately break down bias, distortion, subjectiveness. Because natural laws are applied in a very rational, objective, unbiased manner. They're 100% consistent, they're constant, they're unwavering, they're unprejudiced, they're unchangeable. Yeah, 100% predictable outcome, which I, I tend to be on the analytical side, melancholy, rational, logical. 
those kind of things all appealed to me. I like to take feelings and emotions out of the equation and have something that's 100% predict predictable. So just the, the concept or the practice of learning to think and reason for yourself, learning to seek and love the truth is something that I've learned in this class and I think can be very helpful when trying to make sure that you're getting an accurate perspective or read on yourself. Um, I spent some years of my life in a situation where I would say I really did not want to know truth. Uh, I was pretty sure I wouldn't like the truth if I knew it. Um, so I became quite adept at avoiding, distorting, denying the truth. I was comfortable with that. That, of course, did not make the truth any less true. Um, and as Tim has said, you cannot bend the truth. It's unbendable. Um, you can bend your mind around the truth, but the truth stays the same. Like if you're, if you're holding up a glass or a lens between you and a, a straight telephone pole, to your eye, the pole looks for all the world like it's bent, but it's still as straight as it ever was. Um, I believe for sure the most important truth to know and the truth that sets us free from Satan's lies is the truth that God is exactly who Jesus revealed him to be. But I believe when he said, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free, he was talking about all truth. And that this love of truth and pursuit of the truth could be liberating in every area of our lives. Because this is how we were made. Am I the only one? Has anyone else ever experienced this? When you've come to really know and accept the truth, maybe in a relationship, maybe in a job or a career choice, uh, which college to attend or which major field of study, a medical diagnosis or condition. Uh, and I would say, don't misunderstand, think that that's easy. But, but sometimes it can be painful because we're so attached to other things. Yes. That, um, and we thought our plan was right. It, it, it may be liberating, but only after we have had some painful uh, release of other things. No question. As I was saying it's not easy. It's, it's not a struggle. But I have found even if the truth is unpleasant, if it's frightening, if it's painful or even heartbreaking, if I search for the truth, if I'm open to it and acknowledge it, even embrace it, I find that even painful truth can be liberating and freeing. And it puts me in a much better position to be able to handle and address whatever the truth is versus being self-deceived, being in denial. Any thoughts on that? Am I the only one that has experienced that painful lesson? Still struggle with it? When, when God came to Adam and Eve in the garden, he came, oh. he came with the truth, but they were, they were still afraid, not because mm -hmm. it wasn't truth, but because they had been changed. Correct. And if they had known the truth, they would have been set free. I like that. So, Sunday and Monday's lesson are kind of a compare and a contrast between the attributes of a fool and the attributes of the wise. So I'm going to com try to combine Sunday and Monday's lesson a little bit so we can, we can take the, the characteristics and contrast them against themselves. So the first attribute of a fool listed in Sunday's lesson is that a fool speaks proudly. <clears throat> Proud words have resulted in a blow to his lips an outcome contrasted with the lips of the wise, which are preserved. And it seems like, if you notice this, the quarterly never misses an opportunity to mention the eventual punishment. <laughs> the quarterly says, the rod associated with the fool's lips in Proverbs 14.3 implies the fool's eventual punishment. Do we think this is really what the text implies?
The New Living Translation of the same text, Proverbs 14.3, says, A fool's proud talk becomes a rod that beats him, but the words of the wise keep them safe. What translation? That was the, mess, uh, the New Living Translation. The Amplified Bible says, In the fool's own mouth is a rod to shame his pride. Does that sound like punishment? Or at least external? Doesn't sound like external punishment. Yeah, it sounds like he's capable of bringing himself down. Luke 6.45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Matthew 12.37, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. This doesn't sound like external punishment to me. This sounds like natural consequences of speaking proudly. Another similar proverb found in Proverbs 17, verse 28, reads, Even dunces who keep quiet are thought to be wise. As long as they keep their mouth shut, they're smart. <laughs> this is rumored to be the basis of another familiar quote, often attributed to Mark Twain or Abraham Lincoln, but I was unable to confirm either of those. But it says, It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. <laughs> Okay, so in contrast to speaking proudly, Monday's lesson, the first attribute, says that the wise speak humbly. The wise restrain their mouths as evidenced by silent reflection. They really listen thoughtfully, considering opposing ideas, weighing out evidence, trying to learn from others. Is this a struggle for anyone here to restrain their mouths? find it to be. And in this culture of social media, is it not just our mouths we have to restrain? We may have to restrain our key, our fingers on a keyboard or our thumbs on a phone. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Second attribute of the foolish in Sunday's lesson, a fool mocks wisdom. A fool appears to seek wisdom, but is skeptical of it and doesn't believe in true wisdom. He will not find it because in his, in his own mind there is no wisdom apart from himself. I'd say if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then believing you are wise in and of yourself has to be at the opposite end of that spectrum. And you're going to start to see that as a theme uh, in the lesson when describing the fool psychology. Most damaging is mocking and misunderstanding the destructive power of sin. And it seems like this view often accompanies the imposed law construct. Because the fear of punishment or the punisher often outweighs any fear of sin's damaging effects and the consequences of, nat of breaking natural law. Wise. The wise value learning and its knowledge. Sitting at the feet of a teacher requires a posture of humility and a teachable spirit. It is, it's quite difficult to be taught or to learn anything if you think you already know it all. The wise are in a constant search for wisdom and knowledge and enjoy the experience of learning and growing. How do we think that uh, mastering this skill might be important for eternity? or not I mean God is infinite we are finite the gap between us is and always will be infinite so we're going to spend all of eternity learning and growing being enlightened by more and more and more truth so if we don't enjoy and value that experience here on earth <clears throat> we're probably not going to like it up there either Third attribute of a fool. A fool is credulous. Again, with the thesaurus, uh, it means gullible, naive, imprudent, unconsidered, uncritical. Quarterly says that the fool has lost the ability to think critically about he, what he hears and believes every word. 
or maybe everything he reads on the internet. The lesson also points out some of the paradox and irony of a secular society that laughs at or impugns belief in God, belief in intelligent design or creation, even though some of their secular beliefs, the Big Bang theory, evolution, when tested, can appear quite foolish and require even more faith. By contrast, the wise are cautious. It says the wise are acutely aware that evil exists and they recognize, they fully recognize the destructive power of sin, so they are careful. I would say that the wise fully understand the nature of God's law and the consequences of being out of harmony with natural law. They do not rely on their own feelings and personal opinions, but practice a more integrated evidence-based approach to help discern good from bad, right from wrong, or truth from lies. Fourth attribute of the fool. The fool is impulsive. Because fools believe that they have the truth within themselves, they react quickly, impulsively, without taking time to think. I mean, look. Yeah, I look at the Twitter sphere, the Twitter sphere culture that we have going on right now. Do we see any quick, impulsive, knee-jerk reactions happening today? I mean, at the speed of light. And it's painfully obvious that most took no time to think about the comments they're making, the consequences. And they're making those comments to the world into perpetuity. So any thoughts on how this, this ability to spout off our thoughts to the world at every whim <clears throat> with a certain degree of anonymity have further impacted our ability to show our foolishness in this regard? I mean, this is, this, some of this has lifelong consequences. I mean, we're talking about kids who are unable to get into the college of their choice because of posts that they've made or pictures that they've posted. Um, we're talking about people not being able to be hired for a job they might be qualified for. We're talking about people losing their jobs. They're in business losing customers, losing advertisers, losing sponsors. Foolish. So in contrast, the wise are calm. The lesson indicates that faith in God allows the wise to relax, practice self-control, and the fear of God gives them confidence. I don't have any argument with that. <clears throat> it doesn't really depend on what God you believe in, in which law lens you look through, whether fearing and trusting God makes you calm and gives you peace. Tim has mentioned in this class an analogy, I think he uses with his patients who are struggling with being told just trust God. Turn it over to God. Turn your life over to God. So he tells them to imagine walking at the mall, having a stranger come up to you and ask for your house keys and saying, no, oh, it's okay. Just trust me. And would they feel comfortable giving a stranger the keys to their house? Would that make them feel calm and peaceful? If not, then how could they possibly turn the keys to their life, to their future, over to a stranger? It is so important that we get to know God for who he really is and what he's really like, and we get to know that for ourselves. Only then can we be confident putting our trust in him and be filled with his peace that passes all understanding. Fifth attribute of the fool. The fool oppresses others. Fools are intolerant. They will oppress others and treat them with contempt. These are the tactics of Satan. Satan. These are the characteristics of the beast system. Coercion, intolerance, force, and oppression. How often are these actions taken in the name of the church or in the name of God? Do you think of any examples? Yes, Eve. Um, I was looking at a, a post on YouTube this week that, while it had a good point, um, it, would, it had a title of something like, Atheists, Take That! <laughs> and uh, it just kind of made me laugh because we don't like it 
when they, you know, try to pound right. what they think into us. And it's not any different if we try it to them. Um, it's, it's still from the wrong spirit. Right. Um, In fact, I think it might even be more heinous because of what we are purported to represent. You know, both Christianity and Islam spread in the early parts of uh, history, mm -hmm. modern history, with a convert or die philosophy. Right. So and it, both of those religions thought they were doing it and they would go. Yeah, I have down the Roman church, the Crusades, ISIS. What about the, the genocide in, was it Rwanda? What about the pro-life movement, even in this country? These are characteristics of the beast system, typically under the guise of the church or in the name of God. So by contrast, wise, the wise are compassionate and sensitive. The quarterly points out the inextricable link between the two most important commandments, love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. It says we cannot love God and treat other people poorly. I think that's profound. The greatest expression of our faith is how we deal with others, especially those in need. you agree or disagree with that? I think that has any correlation to the question Jesus asks the sheep and the goats? When he asks if they, why they didn't feed him, why they didn't clothe him? Yes, Wendell? The sensitivity to the beliefs or the the psyche or intelligence of someone else is critical. Mm -hmm. um, I um, went to a cultural event this week in which I um, went thinking I was going to see a cultural event and yet in the background was a strong message of their own beliefs which they were trying to convert me mm. to their beliefs and it, to me it was not culturally or intellectually sensitive right and I felt offended and yet I think okay does my church does not my outreach do the same thing by using a vehicle to change the opinion of someone else or take advantage of them in, right when they are in a compromised position it's important as we as physicians and, and healthcare workers or as teachers yeah that we don't take advantage of someone's position and we we respect their sensitivity and their intelligence i think that's well said okay so let's look at tuesday's lesson tuesday's lesson is entitled the eyes of the lord and it uses uh the text from proverbs 15 3 that says the eyes of the lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good the Message Bible says God doesn't miss a thing. And the lesson asks, how does this text make you feel and why? Depends on the view. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's two things that I thought were excellent examples of that in my thing. One is a protective parent. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're constantly watching, watching after their children or whatever, caring for their children. Mm -hmm. The other is a landowner. A property owner, mm -hmm. someone who has value, right, is be constantly interested in what they have value in its well-being, in its care. Right. Yeah, and I do. I agree. My next sentence was: Does it how you feel depend on what law lens you look through, mm -hmm. and what your picture of God is? Does this text? I like Wendell's explanation, but does this text bring to mind the recording angel? that used to stand up front of the church during children's study story with a clipboard and a pen, watching, waiting to write down any possible behavior infraction. Outside the movie theater watching. <coughs> Hello. Yeah. What have we learned about natural law concepts that let us know that this text is not talking about a heavenly watchdog or police force? His eyes are everywhere because he's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. Yes, Russell. I now read this text in that um, you know, the eyes of the Lord, the loving Father, who's who's 
father to the evil and to the good. I mean, he his eyes are watching over the evil, yearning after those whose right. characters are are becoming damaged and and getting to the point where they're so damaged that they'll be actually be beyond the reach of the Holy Spirit. And he's <clears throat> his his heart of infinite love is is yearning after them right. for them to change their way. Right. No, oh, I think that's a beautiful picture. He sees everything because natural laws have consequences. Mm -hmm. The results of those are evident. If we've been converted and healed, he sees it because then we look like Christ. If we've not been converted and we remain terminal, he sees it. And like Russell said, he's longing after it, his desire for they, them to be healed too. So Tuesday's lesson also talks about Solomon's understanding that true wisdom is the ability to correctly discern between good and evil, the right from the wrong. I think that's accurate. I think it's well said. But in a rather predictable manner, it then goes into the heavenly recording angel mindset that God sees everything we do, even if no one else does, that on a human level, knowing this should help us to remember to always do good instead of evil, and to not be fooled into thinking that just because we might seem to get away with doing evil for now, in the long run, we never do. And once again, they, when you're looking at it from that perspective, it misses the fact that sin changes us. Yes. That it hurts. In a destructive way. A single person ever in the history of this planet who has ever gotten away with it. Right. Because they were injured. That's my question. Do we really believe this is why God desires us to do what is right? Because we know he's watching and he's not going to let us get away with it? This is based on fear. Absolutely. And again, not fear of sin, not fear of the actual destructive element. Fear of the watcher. So I, I think this is, this is the very bottom, the most elementary level of the moral development scale that we've talked about. Punishment and reward. Mrs. White says a sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. The service is looked on by, upon by such a one in the light of drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. That's not what he wants. That was from That I May Know Him. But you know, how do you teach little children things like one time the song Jesus loves me, the second verse Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. He loves me when I'm bad, although it makes him very sad. Mm -hmm. I had a mother one time that said, I don't want you singing that verse to my child. You know, they don't need to know that when they do bad, God is sad. And I'm like, why? Right. They said, because God loves him regardless. I'm saying it has nothing to do with love, but it can still make him sad. For sure. You know? So how do you raise kids with the concept of when they do wrong or bad, whatever, um, God still loves them, but mm -hmm. he doesn't like what they do without stepping on somebody's feet. I'm saying there's right. very sensitive that nowadays. Well, I mean, the only way I could relate to it is as a parent to a child. You still love your child when you don't like their behavior. And you typically don't like their behavior because it's causing them pain or it's damaging them. Doesn't mean you don't love them, but you want to see them do the most positive thing. You know? But it's like they don't want, they don't want the kids to look at God as anything but a happy, perfect father. You know what I'm saying? They don't, don't ever disappoint you. Well, it's also consequences. We don't like to take consequences. You know? We don't want to suffer Correct. The consequences of our actions. Right. Yeah, and a lot of time we remove those. I have another text that we've, or another quote that we've read often in this class. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for his sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstances that bring the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. This is why it's so dangerous for the attribute of a fool to mock sin. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. And just like 
again, there, there seems to be relatively little argument with laws of physics and things. No one gets away with stepping off the Empire State Building in violation of the law of gravity. No one gets away with tying a plastic bag over their head in violation of the law of respiration. Natural law requires no monitoring, no recording, no enforcement. Imposed laws are the only kind that require external enforcement or external punishment. We do not need the gravity police. Mm. I had this conversation with one of my clients who teaches physics over at the university. Uh -huh. And I actually used the term in violation of the law of gravity. And he interrupted me and said, no, no that, that law can't be violated. You, you, don't, you don't violate the law of gravity. It, it can't be violated. Right. And, and it kind of, kind of hit me. I said, well, you can operate outside the law of gravity. I mean, you can, you can, you can take a spaceship up to mm -hmm. space where your gravity, uh, you know, where your gravity frees. And, well, gravity still... It's in effect. It's still, it's still acting on you. Mm -hmm. Even though you can function in a, in a gravity-free environment, there's still gravity in the universe. Interesting. Kind of fascinating that you can't violate the law of gravity. And then, then, then my mind started talking, well, if you can't violate the law of gravity, you can't violate any natural law. Interesting. You can suffer the consequences of disregarding the law. Yes. Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can assume it doesn't apply to you, but, it, but incorrectly. <laughs> so yeah, even if you're operating in a love-free environment, you can't violate the law of love. It's right. still, wow. And the sad thing is we sometimes interpret the seeming lack of immediate consequences exactly. um, incorrectly. You know, and God's loving, patient, long-suffering grace is a big part of yes. why we don't. Yes, we are being kept alive right. unnaturally in a sustained state that should have ended long ago. Some laws take a long time for us to see the result. Right. Yeah. Let's look at Wednesday's lesson. It's entitled The Joy of the Lord. <clears throat> and there's a, some elements of Proverbs 15 that speaks specifically to happiness and joy. Verse 13 says, a cheerful heart brings a smile to your face. A sad, heart make, a sad heart makes it hard to get through the day. Verse 15 says, a miserable heart means a miserable life. A cheerful heart fills the day with song. Verse 30, a twinkle in the eye means joy in the heart. And good news makes you feel fit as a fiddle. So clearly we are not promised a life without trials or stress. In fact, I think the opposite is true based on scripture. Matthew 6.34 says, So do not worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the troubles each day brings. John 16.33 says, Jesus is saying, I've told, you, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace, but in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So we're advised to have a merry heart, to be content in all circumstances, rejoice in trials, even count it all joy. You might have trouble with that? Mm -hmm. It would seem, based on, on those pieces of advice, that the key to deep, lasting joy is not in the changing details of our circumstances, but rather in how we respond to them, based on our trust in the constant, unchanging goodness of God. The quarterly mentions some parallels between verses 13 and 14 that indicate the merry heart is the heart of him who has understanding, the heart of one who has faith and sees redemption beyond the immediate ordeal. And it also said this is why it is so crucial that we know for ourselves, from our own experience, the reality of God and his love. Then whatever trials come, whatever suffering we face, 
those with understanding can endure because they know God's love for themselves. I think that's well said. That's the experience arm of the, the three-pronged approach. This chapter also introduces another important idea that joy comes more from what we give than from what we receive. A good word shared with others will bring joy to the giver. Has anyone here experienced that? Experienced the blessing that comes from being a blessing to others <coughs> with your words or your deeds or both? Another related factor that contributes to our level of happiness and joy talks about developing an attitude of gratitude and developing a repeatable practice such as keeping a gratitude journal or putting together lists or a series of photographs or memories. Just taking time each day to reflect on moments or events or people, things that you're grateful for. But you know, there's so many different personalities. Mm -hmm. That has a lot to do with how people react to situations. Yes. There's some people that nothing ever bothers them. Yeah, so what? And there's other people that worry all the time. Right. So even though you might have a strong relationship with God, if you have a personality type that worries about things, it's, it's mm -hmm. difficult. More so than the happy-go-lucky person. Yes. I, I relate to what she's saying. And I've I heard some really great information in a, a sermon. Um, it, it reminded me of, of stuff Tim teaches. Mm -hmm. It, the name of the sermon was Brain Rain, which was kind of a neat title. Interesting. And it was um, really talking about, you know, how we take every thought captive. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the speaker ended with the idea of, um, she shared how, and she had explained a lot of the things that Tim explains about right. how the brain works. She explained about how she had experienced such a blessing from what she called wiring her brain for joy. And, and this idea of purposefully mm -hmm. looking for things to be grateful for, like immersing yourself yes. in, in the blessings of life, and, because Satan is ready to treat sure. us with negative, and how that had slowly but surely transformed her, her whole, even her reactions to right. And that, I think that's a, a key thing. Oh, I think it is too. And that's, that's what I have in, in my notes is there are a, there's a significant amount of research out there that supports this development and of a practice and a new habit can physically and physiologically change the way we react to situations. So even if we are, we have tendencies towards worry or fret or things like that, if we practice gratitude then things that would normally cause us to worry, we can shift our brain to where the reaction to that is being grateful or to try and seeing a blessing in it or try and see the positive in it instead of immediately going to worry or stress. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a significant amount of research. I've got a couple of studies. These will be in the notes. There's a study that says this regular ha habit or practice of being grateful leads to a relative absence of stress and depression uh, there was measurable progress toward important personal goals. People had higher levels of determination and energy. They had closer relationships and the desire to build stronger relationships. Um, and they measured increased levels of happiness by up to 25% more happy for people that had, had engaged in this practice of, of regularly writing what they're grateful for. Like a medicine. Yes, one of the founders of our church agreed with this concept and wrote in a book called Ministry of Healing around 100 years before any of these studies were conducted. She said, nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy. For those of us who have Myers-Briggs personality that is melancholy, this is a struggle. <laughs> It's a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings, 
as much a duty as it is to pray. If we are heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners, groaning and complaining all along the way to our Father's house? Those professed Christians who are constantly complaining and who seem to think cheerfulness and happiness a sin have not genuine religion. Can I get an amen? <laughs> uh, Thursday's lesson. Thursday's lesson is entitled The Sovereignty of God. First paragraph in Thursday's lesson says, the Bible acknowledges the value of human responsibility and freedom, yet the Bible also affirms God's control over the course of events. Any thoughts on that sentence? Yes, Eve. I object. <laughs> you know, when I read that and I saw the text that went along with it, I said, you know, accurate prediction of the course of events is not control. Not even close. It's not even close. Um, and to say that God controls puts us in a very bad place and puts him in a very bad place. Yes. You know, so God controls, you know, all of the bad things that happen to you. Really? I was pretty sure it's because I live in a war zone. Correct. Um, you know, so it just, I just, no, I bristled as well. Um, Some people find comfort in that. Oh, they would rather have that. Yes. And so it relieves them of certain responsibilities. Or all. Or it explains <laughs> things that they find uncomfortable yes. about their life and that they have not comprehended about why it's bad. Correct. And so God gets blamed for everything. Yeah, it's a, it's a rubber stamp kind of answer. <coughs> but to me, it also horrifically minimizes the incredible importance of freedom in God's universe. Isn't freedom valued above all? I mean, it's, it's the reason he went ahead and created Lucifer. It's the reason he went ahead and created Earth knowing Christ's sacrifice would be required. Freedom is, it's valued above all. It's not just acknowledged in the Bible. So we prepare, we make plans, but the last word still belongs to God. And I have the question, does it? Based on what we just talked about with Eve. I can take anything and turn it around for good. It does not say that Eve designed it to happen. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's actually where some of our gratitude and contentment can come from. Come from. Like Paul said, I can be con content in all circumstances because I know I can do all things through Christ. That's correct. It's not a matter of, you know, this came, this must be God's will for my life. No, it's this came, God can help me through it, and even better, he can turn it around turn it. his glory. She apparently... Yeah, but it doesn't mean he will. Correct. He will not violate our freedom. I, I, I don't know you believe this, but just because he can do something doesn't mean he will. He's not going to violate humanity or, or heavenly beings uh, of ability to choose their own pathway. And again, this goes back to your, your stressing freedom because right. God is a God of freedom, freedom of choice. And um, what we see, <clears throat> I think we see a continuing deterioration of the valuing of freedom. Yes. Um, certainly in our country. Even the definition. Uh, yes, the definition of freedom of cha has changed. You know, you're you're free to agree with me. You're, free to you're, you're free to believe what I believe. Right. Um, you know, and, and with a country that was originally founded on the, you know the Protestant values of liberty of conscience mm -hmm. and that and the other, we see. We see a continual erosion of that <laughs> for sure. the last hundred years. And it's going to have to erode if yes. we believe what's going to happen is yes. going to actually happen. So yeah, it looks like Eve was, had special insight into my notes. Because um, <laughs> I, I talked about, for sure, our preparations are not worthless. Our initiative is not worth, worthless. Our, uh, our desire for 
to make plans, um, but it's more an attitude of seeking and submission and being teachable and having a desire for that direction. The thing is, God is infinite. Therefore, accomplishing God's will in my life can have an infinite number of avenues. He's not limited. So what is God's will for me? What's God's will for all of us? Yes, that we all be saved, that we all be healed, that we all be restored. Yes, that we all come to know him, to be set right with him. And he has promised that he can use every single thing that happens in our life to complete that good work in us and perfect our characters. I think this is what Tim means when he talks about trusting God with outcomes. So we are responsible for sure for our own conduct as parents, as teachers, as spouses. But he has promised to work all things for our good. That's Romans 8. He's promised to even work the things that were intended for evil or intended to harm us for our good. As in the story of Joseph. So we do, we do our work, we do our due diligence, and then we trust him with the outcomes. Really easy to say, <laughs> really difficult to practice. I think our ultimate goal is to actually pray for wisdom just like Solomon did and then not blow it, <laughs> but to find out what God, how we can obey what he wants and expects of us because like you said, Nadab and Abihu, Lot's wife and the others, they were out of obedience with God's requests. Right. And we or it, it, they could be sincere in their belief, but be sincerely right. wrong. And he has promised if we ask, if we pray for wisdom, it's guaranteed. He's told us that he will give us that wisdom. He'll give us that insight uh, into his character. That's pretty much all I have for this lesson. And it's pretty close. Unless anybody has some, any more thoughts or concepts on the, the contrast of the fools and the, and the wise. Did anybody else feel like a fool when they read this lesson? I kind of did. I ticked every box. So, uh, yeah, there's some, there's some things to work on. And I mean, I think we make it much, we make this whole thing much more complicated than it is. If we read the book of Proverbs, there is no mystery there. It tells us everything to do, to be happy, to be prosperous, to be cheerful, to have an abundant life. And it tells us what the contrast of that is. So, uh... That's no... not within our power. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it takes a power from... It does. Beyond us. Supernatural. Right. For sure. Thank you for your comments, your participation. Let's close class with prayer. Father God, thank you for uh, showing us showing us your character, showing us who you are, and showing us that, that you are not as you have been portrayed to be. Um, we ask that you would continue to, to work on our hearts and work on our minds and continue to reveal, reveal more truth about who you are and uh, reveal to us how we can take this liberating, freeing message to those we come in contact with. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.